We, as I said, have a very interesting uh, panel coming up on the reforming of the scientific publishing. And we hope that uh, some of the issues that we've heard this morning will also come up um, in the discussions um, in, in this particular session. We've heard about the preprints, we've heard about the indexes, we've heard about business models for non-commercial publishing, scientific publishing and open science in general. So hopefully um, our, our speakers uh, in this session will also address some of these uh, issues. But the moderator for this session is Ms. Loida Garcia Febo, and I am very pleased that she uh, is able to be here with us today. She is the International Library Consultant and Chair of the American Library Association, the United Nations SDGs Subcommittee. So the floor is yours, and um, there we go. Thank you. Yes, great. Well, welcome to uh, the session on reforming scientific publishing. I still remember the first of these conferences, and we're now in the third, so long life. We do need spaces like this. Our actions today have an impact on future generations. What can we do to minimize this impact or make it as positive as our current evidence allows? I'm looking forward to what our esteemed speakers will share today. Yesterday and today, we have spoken about the need to open the entire research life cycle, equalizing the playing, of, uh, playing field, engaging underrepresented communities in the advancement of OA. And the president of the General Assembly spoke about intentionally including historically marginalized groups, communities that have been marginalized and have been excluded from research for too long. We need everyone to join these efforts. Libraries, my field, are development accelerators. Libraries are champions of open access, publishing, and are working together with global players with the aim of democratizing the record of science and helping accelerate the implementation of the SDGs. In this session, we will hear from successful open science initiatives and educators about challenges and opportunities for generating greater access to scientific knowledge in service of the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs. Topics include global inequities in accessing scientific information in support of education about the SDGs, the need for a new research assessment ecosystem that will allow and also serve citizen science, author access, reader access, with Creative Commons licensing and the potential for a global, interoperable, open science infrastructure of tools, services, in hardware and software, including data. As pointed out at the prior Open Science conferences and by Jenna Kopoulos at the ECOSOC Partnerships Forums just a few days ago, a global science commons is an infrastructure in service of the sustainable development goals that can support and promote the global normalization of opening scientific outputs and processes and the re-evaluation of research assessments and the academic reward culture. Promising. Now, housekeeping. We are taking questions after all the speakers have presented. Our virtual audience can type their questions on the uh, sidebar any moment. And in person audience, you know, raise your hand and speak into the microphone in front of you. We are busy agenda. Now our first speaker. Ms. Carolina Botero, director of Charisma Foundation. She is a columnist for El Espectador en La Silla Vacía. Google that. She is a lawyer with a master in international law and cooperation and a master in trade and contract law. For more than a decade, she has been working to promote and defend human rights on the internet. She's a member of the Creative Commons Board of Directors and of CSAC, the Civil Society Observer Group before the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. Thank you so much, Ms. Carolina Botero, for joining us today. 
Thank you very much for this invitation. I am very pleased to uh, address the panel and, and to be here with you. Uh, I see that the presentation is already shared. Would you like to uh, run it yourself or should I? Uh, it's up to you. What works best for you? Uh, I'll try. If not, then we go for that. Thank you very much. Um, so, first of all, uh, again, I was saying uh, thanks for, um, to UNESCO for this presentation, for giving me the opportunity to take the floor. I believe you're already looking at my presentation. Um, and I would like to, of course, tell you that probably my approach to this question that was posed by UNESCO, why should we reform scientific publishing, is a bit different uh, because what I am mostly working right now is on citizen science and uh, better said also in Latin America, participatory science. And it is from this perspective that I took the question. Uh, so I come from Colombia in Latin America and uh, with this question of publishing arose uh, right now, I think about three different questions. How is science being constructed? How has how is science been constructed? How is Colombia's diversity reflected in our scientific pro production? And for what and for whom is research done in Colombia? And briefly, in these 10 minutes, I would like to address the three of them. And my first question is, is open science addressing such purpose, the idea that um, of that the uh, scientific publishing arrived to everybody. And, and I think that my main takeaway from an open science perspective is precisely that, that creation, evaluation, communication of scientific knowledge is open for everybody, for all society, and not just for tra traditional scientific community. At least this is the way that uh, open science promotes itself. It wants to address everyone and therefore, uh, but scientific knowledge publication is key to this. So then my, my first question is how is science constructed? And coming from Latin America, I have to say that uh, Latin America, Asia and African scholars have developed interesting dialogues that are connected completely with the open science vision, uh, whether it is epistemologies of the South or action participation or epistemic justice, all these theoretical frames are talking about how to use science for everyone and science that comes from everyone. However, these ideas have currently no impact on science and innovation policies in the region. And here it's, I talk specifically of Latin America. Latin American policies and on science and innovation continue to follow the global circuits. This means that objectives are mostly productivity, innovation capacity, excellence, and the priorities tend to be internal, internationalization and how to grade good in the academic rankings. Um, if one has this, the problem then is also, because we're talking about publishing, is how the science is being dis disseminated. Here, we have a better experience in Latin America. Open access policies have been really successful in the region. Science today in Latin America can be published openly within the reach of anyone. And there are many countries in the region with open access policies. The production, however, of knowledge for scientific journals continue to be central. Um, the, the national policies, as long as national policies do, policies do not acknowledge this shift on the open access policies and uh, create different incentives, the truth is that the journals, the, the idea of close publication, impact assessment, scientific agenda closer to the global rather than to local agendas, and uh, difficulties on evaluation mechanisms that continue and change will mean that open access is successful, but it is not um, the general rule. It is still far from being uh, the general rule for scientific publication. My next question one how, was, how is Colombia's diversity reflected in our scientific production? And here, 
In Colombia, just as in, in many places in the world, actually it was recognized as such at the UNESCO Open Science Recommendations, we can, we will find bi visibility biases. So there are, there, is, uh, there are populations that are invisibilized. When you, are, when you looked into the, the way science is being published and how it is uh, being distributed via the scientific journals. There, there are people with, which profiles are different from those of white men whether they are women, they are uh, racialized populations, or people from diverse ethnic origin, minorities, etc., minorities, etc., that are not reaching the same level of visibilization. And again, there are no policies uh, in place to try to balance that situation. My final question was: For what and for whom is research done in Colombia? So current science lines, landscape in developing countries, Colombia, of course, is a specific, especially precariousness on the way that it addresses public investments in research. The truth is that it has been, been pushing the universities and other scientific centers towards academic capitalism that focus on values, metrics, and professionals to the business world. This has been weakening more and more the role of academic institutions that no longer see themselves as agents of social change, but rather need to fight for survival. It has also been displacing the fundamental values of academic activity, for instance, autonomy and freedom, to potential contributions uh, and, and, and the potential contributions to the guarantee of rights, cognitive justice and social justice. So it's, it's hard to say that today, Academics has academy in Latin America uh, has an, an an open position or a, or an open uh, capacity to uh, adopt real open science. And finally, for what and for whom is research being done in Colombia? My main concern, at least, is that many do not see science as the engine of answers from community logics and close to other epistemologies different from the Western. Because again, incentives are so strong to look at internationalization and other logics different from academy that uh, the, the, the end up question is, uh, is always, there's a unique science and uh, unique values. I believe that one of the big challenges of open science and therefore um, open publishing or scientific publishing better is to face the prevalent idea that there is not a single science that the science, at, if it's one science, it should be the engine of efficient and productive solutions. Scientific publications, therefore, need to bet for diversity and, uh, re and, and go away from the idea of a unique science. I do not want to leave this um, audience without saying that there is also the need to address unusual, unusual actors too. If we want to properly disseminate uh, scientific production, we need to look beyond the academics because open science and the idea of uh, reaching all the science possible includes other actors. Coming from an activist position, I do believe that uh, activist professionals, civil society organizations are providing important answers and developing open practices that are giving answers to local situations, to local problems, to local questions. Therefore, we have a rich understanding of what it means to work in frontier spaces, where there are constant translation between lay knowledge, non-scientific expert knowledge, and scientific knowledge. We've been successful providing answers to social change, and we are committed to answer local problems. Therefore, scientific publications need to address diversity also when it refers to initial actors. Only this way we will uh, address the big problems of science. Therefore, my question, my, my final um, provocation for you is how can we make open science policies not only to drive and improve efficiency and productivity, but also to serve to democratize knowledge and build citizenship, to develop evidence-based public policy and strengthen democracy. All this uh, is part of what I work as activist in Colombia, 
And it is, of course, what I wanted uh, to say here and to lead to you. Thank you again very much. I hope I remain in my, in my time and I'm eager to listen to the other panelists. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Botero. I uh, wholeheartedly agree with you in terms of the a need for policies um, to democratize knowledge. Um, and I will add uh, personally also um, for everyone to um, observe this uh, very important point of uh, staying clear from um, savior complexes or patronizing ways when we are working with, um, you know, uh, the historically marginalized populations and all the matters uh, explained by our uh, colleague, um, Ms. Botero. Also, activism is uh, more important than ever. Thank you again. Um, our next speaker is uh, Ms. Susan Mary. She is the CEO of African Journals Online. Her academic background is on development economics and has previously had nonprofit training organization work experience. Ms. Mary has grown Asia to a huge online library of African research output and various services. Uh, this organization serves millions and millions of people on the continent and around the world. She considers herself extremely fortunate to work with a wonderful group of dedicated, expert, and lighthearted colleagues who have brought important African research outputs to global prominence. Welcome, Ms. Mary. Thanks so much. Greetings, everybody. Um, it's been a fascinating conference so far, and thank you so much to the organizers for inviting African journals online to contribute. Um, I was asked to talk about reform, reforming scientific publishing. Um, what I'm actually going to do is to take uh, the opportunity to shine a light um, on some sound models um, that already exist in this regard. Uh, briefly, African Journals Online is a nonprofit organization based in South Africa. Um, and also our main offering is a journal hosting platform based on free and open source softwares of various kinds primarily open journal systems software. And we work to increase the quality, visibility of, and access to African published peer-reviewed scholarly journals in order to offset historical global inequities in scholarly publishing. Regional platforms like AGEL, uh, which was started in 1998, um, and also the several Latin American uh, regional uh, platforms that Ariana uh, so brilliantly talked about in the keynote, emerged as a result of these entrenched global equities in scholarly publishing um, in order to strengthen the research ecosystem in developing countries and developing regions. Uh, within Africa, researchers here, policymakers and practitioners need access to relevant quality research publications from an on-African multiplicity of African con contexts in order to develop solutions to address the continent's challenges in health, education, climate change, under development, basically all of the uh, sustainable development goals. Um, but also in order for researchers to have agency as knowledge producers and contributors uh, and not passive consumers um, of research outputs from the global north. Um, I think it's really important to take a deep dive into the, the definitions that we commonly use, that we think that we are all understanding one another very clearly because they are obvious and simple terms. But deconstructing the, the, the misperception that I'm trying to do here requires a, a little bit of a, a definition of what a journal actually is. So my, it, my suspicion is that for the majority of people um, who are listening to this conference, um, who are from the global north, have a kind of Plato's form definition of what a journal is as being um, a, a, a journal that is published by one of the huge commercial publishers in North America or Europe. We in developing countries have a rather different understanding of what a journal is. Um, and the typical journal, for example, that AJA works to support in our partnership across the continent 
is a non-profit scholar journal, which is run by subject-specific experts. Um, it's not uh, put out there by publishing experts uh, in general. Um, and there, there is, uh, I must note, a huge range in, in, um, in the different types of journals and publishing entities that we work with. But in general, um, they tend to op operate on the basis of volunteerism. They operate cashlessly um, with a lot of in-kind institutional support. Um, so that's that's quite important that, that to, to distinguish between um, the types of journals that these regional platforms are, are, are working to serve. Um, so we provide various publishing services basically to the collective of all of the journals from 38 different countries um, that we work with. Uh, we um, provide these services in a way that, that results in economies of scale and hopefully uh, an indication of professionalism to readers and librarians from other parts of the world or from neighboring countries. Um, and it allows the, the journals that we work with who often are working out of really resource-constrained resource institutions, even with really poor internet connectivity, if, if at all, um, the, those kinds of um, publishing quality um, indicators that are needed for um, researchers to choose those journals to publish in and for readers and researchers to be able to um, trust uh, the content um, in those in those journals from within the continent. Um, we did not really set ourselves up to be a kind of arbiter of journal quality, uh, but we realized after some time that we were being used as such. And in order to step up <laughs> to that usage, we developed something called the Journal Publishing Practices and Standards Framework. Uh, we're not huge fans of metrics and rankings. <laughs> so this is our solution um, of transparently um, sharing the quality of publishing practices that is being attained by the journals that we work for. Um, and also to, um, to signal uh, to, to users as a, where, where a journal is managing to, to attain and also as a, as a learning tool for journals to become more familiar with the kinds of practices that they need to to reach, um, basically the 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 highest tier, um, the, which we don't really have any of journals reaching that yet on on Agile, um, is all the way into really strong um, policy uh, policies on you know gender and language and uh, data sets and so on that um, that you know the the kind of overseas or, pro or professionally published journals would be attaining. What is really critical to realize, and this is what my, my core point um, that I would like you to take home from this presentation, the core point is to realize that the magnitude of the role of these types of journals that we work with, and also of the role in the regional platforms that support them in developing countries, is radically underestimated. This is a piece of research relatively recently published by um, some of our colleagues at the Public Knowledge Project, um, who are the custodians of the open journal system software that we're based on. Um, and I just want to highlight a few of the points that they make in their abstract. So they um, have recently looked at 25,000 odd journals around the world um, that are using actively open journal systems for, um, for their publishing practice. Um, and what the study demonstrates is that scholarly communication is more of a global endeavor than is actually commonly credited. Um, so set, well, basically 80% of the journals that they looked at are publishing from the global south, and 84.2 of them are following the open access diamond model. Um, just as an aside, this is something that we are hoping to be able to um, allow the continuation of within the African context to provide the kind of services that are needed so that the, jour the journals that we work with that are diamond model can continue being so while continuously improving their quality. So going back to this abstract, um, South a substantial proportion of these journals operate in more than one language, nearly half of them, um, but for all of their geographic, linguistic and disciplinary diversity, only 1.2% of the journals analyzed in the study are indexed in the web of science. 
only 5.7% in Scopus. And on the other hand, and another aside, this is probably busting a bit of a myth about um, deceptive journals being published out of the global south, 1% of these titles are found in Cabell's predatory reports, and 1.4% show up in Beale's questionable list. So that just gives you uh, a better idea of um, the really strong um, pathways to uh, developing country journal publishing that do um, already exist and that are used and relied on. So um, what I'd like to emphasize um, in this is a, an extract um, from the UNESCO recommendation on open science document is that these kinds of developing country platforms um, actually constitute a publishing system that is arguably much closer to the values and principles of open science um, than is the case of the giant commercial publishing companies in North America and Europe, which are referred to in the same document as the traditional scientific community. I would like to also take the opportunity to just focus on the sustainability principle um, in, this, in this suite. Um, and that F is, is just a, a, an explanation of um, what, well, it's, a, it's an extract of what the document says about the sustainability aspect of things. I um, think that the system in Latin America is brilliant and something that I really wish um, Africa would um, aspire to emulating. Um, Agile <laughs> is not the same as the, as the platforms in Latin America in that, although we are striving uh, to meet the need for the public good of this knowledge sharing and supporting, we haven't been <laughs> um, supported by public funds from within the continent ever. Um, we would use this opportunity, therefore, as an appeal to UNESCO to use their influence for the member countries from within Africa to please tangibly assist in supporting AGEL's work in terms of funding um, and also in terms of recogni recognizing our role in the development of their open science policies and strategies. Um, we would very much welcome um, they're reaching out to collaborate um, with us. Uh, that is one of the core principles um, that Agile espouses. Um, so again, thank you so much uh, for the focus of this conference and for inviting us to contribute. And that's it, looking forward to the questions. Thank you, thank you, Ms. Mary. Um, to me, it's very interesting um, how uh, this concept, right, the non nonprofit scholar journals and the um, the model that um, Ms. Mary presented, right, Ajol, um, now it stands against things, for instance, um, uh, when the Vermont State University has announced that they're going to close all the libraries. And it's just being announced by the new um, person that will be leading the organization. And so um, where that leaves, for instance, and this is just the tip of the iceberg, right? Um, this uh, uh, Global South, right? The publications that are not indexed, that are not uh, included by these big publishers. So the disparity in will increase enormously. And it's very alarming, very concerning, and this is a university in the global north, right? We're not even uh, going to uh, the potential chilling effect that these um, changes can have for the rest of the world. Um, when um, people are taking for granted that everybody has digital connectivity, for one. So I'll leave you with that and we go to the next speaker. Is um, welcome Miss Joy Owango. Give me my glasses is an experienced award-winning founding director of the Training Center in Communication, TCC Africa, and award-winning trust reg registered in Kenya in 2006. TCC Africa is in partnership with the University of Nairobi and provides capacity support in providing African researchers output and visibility through training in scholarly and science communication. As the director of TCC Africa, 
She is currently working with all 15 African countries that have committed to spending 1% of their GPD in higher education and research development. Uh, she was a practitioner with Clarivate Analytics and worked with the governments of Kenya, Tanzania, Rwanda, Mauritius, Ghana, Senegal, Burkina Faso, and created foundational opportunities value at approximately $1.3 million. Welcome, Ms. Awango. Thank you so much. So what I'm going to take you through is uh, some of the, espousing some of the presentations that have been made by my colleagues. But for looking at how, uh, looking at the current open science African perspectives and the strategic partnerships we have made in democratizing knowledge, especially when it comes to increasing the visibility of African research. Um, our values as a center in order to make collaboration effective is uh, we, we have to be collaborative and um, we have to be collaborative, we are supportive because most of the time our partners are not particularly aware of the ecosystem in Africa and we are goal oriented. And because of this, one of the things that we've been very keen on in working with most of our partners is understanding if they have a long-term, um, they have a long-term uh, commitment in working in the continent. And that is one aspect that we are very, very keen on. Now, when you critically look at, at when, you, when you look at the current state of uh, African research output, when you look at the African landscape between 2012 to 2023, we are looking at African researchers have produced over 1.7 million records. Of these, over 724,000 are open access. And the reality is you could, we could actually see more. And one of the biggest problems to why we are not able to see African research, which we've been talking about, is um, not all African research output is indexed. So, and these are some of the problems that I noticed when I was actually working in industry. You'd notice that there's just a small percentage of African research output index, and that is why when we, when we, when we, when we were working in the in the in the center, one of our biggest objectives was to increase the visibility of African research output. Look for partners who are keen on working in the continent, especially global north partners who are keen on working in the continent and are also willing to in, to, to work with us in increasing the visibility. So this 1.7 million is actually paltry compared to what is the reality when if. If we have access to the infrastructure, uh, infrastructural systems that can help in aiding the visibility of our of our output, and I'll share with you how that is possible. Okay, another interesting thing that we cannot ignore is that African researchers have been uh, are quickly accommodating uh, open science practices. As you can see, these are uh, the African researchers have produced over thirty nine thousand uh, preprints. Uh, that is from 1978 to date, and there's a steady rise in uh, in, in this in in this in in, uh, in using this um, uh, normal uh, uh, what do you call it uh, in using this uh, approach to publishing because what it has done it has it has increased the visibility of African research output. So because of this, we have uh, platforms like Africa Archive that have been created uh, to just cater for African preprints that are produced by African researchers. So when, you, when we look at our capacity building ecosystem, our capacity building ecosystem is, is based on, uh, uh, on research excellence. We are looking at how we can support research institutions and researchers in improving their visibility by providing them with open access solutions that are relevant to the continent. Because what we notice is that as much as we're talking about open science, not all the solutions that were there had content that was had enough content that was African. So this was one of the biggest challenges we noted. So as much as we have citation databases, not all of them have enough content that was African and not all of them were keen on indexing African content. content. So one of our partners dimensions was very keen on this. And because of that, we are seeing an increased number of research output, including knowledge and large. We're seeing an increased out, uh, visibility of African output within these international platforms. And please note, these platforms are available free of charge in the entire global south. So our capacity building, um, 
ecosystem also includes supporting higher education leaders in making them understand the open science uh, ecosystem and also governments in understanding the open science uh, ecosystem. So that is at policy level. And also um, library literacy, especially when it comes to understanding the FAIR principles. Now, one of the successful things that we've done and interventions we've done is that, as I said, one of our partners is Dimensions, is that we made sure that um, it's just not an issue of making sure that you have uh, you have access to an open access solution, but it is knowing how to use it, getting all the stakeholders to know that you have these uh, solutions that can help in increasing your visibility. And because of that, we have successfully worked with ministries of education together with the ministries of education, library consortia and research councils and granting councils together to to make sure that we are launching this open access solution in all these countries. These are the 12 countries that with some with more in the pipeline uh, planned for the remaining uh, countries within the continent. And then another thing we noted, as, as I said earlier on, not all, as much as we have a lot of open access platforms, remember, not all of them are keen on indexing output coming out of the continent. This is something we've learned the hard way. So when we work with our uh, with, with Dimensions, one of the first things we did is that we started indexing outputs that came out of the Association of African Universities, which is the umbrella body of all African universities. And then we started also indexing all the outputs that are coming out of the African Journals Online, uh, which Susan Murray has just presented, and also from the preprint, African preprint repository, Africa Archive. And what we noted was, was a bump in the visibility, in, in the increase in the visibility of African research output. And this was so successful that it was published in PLOS One when they did a comparative analysis between Dimensions, Web of Science, Scopus, and they realized, and also the Lens, and they also realized that there was more output coming out of uh, uh, dimensions that was representing African research output. And that is our objective, increasing the visibility of African research output through partnerships. Now, another step that we are trying to do is, um, is now go a step further and increase the visibility of African funders. And what we noted is that, again, when you look at any of these citation databases, we are talking about open science. It doesn't necessarily mean accessible and visible. We noted that, again, African funders are not visible. Except for the National Research Fund uh, uh, found, uh, Foundation in South Africa, you cannot see African funders. So once again, uh, we are working now with the Science Granting Council's initiative, uh, the African Open Science Platform, the Association of African Universities and Dimensions in making sure that we're able to index African funders so that it can also help in increasing collaboration that is coming out of the continent. Now, policy dialogue. As I said, one of our activities also includes policy dialogue. So together with PLOS, we are, our mission is to build and increase open science dialogue at regional, national, and institutional level. And this is what, we've, and we've been doing this through open science dialogues in the region with the main objective of reducing pushback on the adoption of open science and open access. The reality is as much as we, we do have the declaration of open science, the UNESCO declaration of open science, and we are now, everybody's comfortably talking Talking about open science, one of the things we noted is that higher education leaders are not they are not enthusiastically adopting open science. Even some of the policymakers are very cautious. They are cautiously adopting open science, especially in the continent. And that meant that we needed to do quite a lot of policy dialogue, whereby we engaged all the higher education stakeholders to have this conversation on open science and come up with next tangible and practical and contextualized next steps on how open science can be in invested within their respective countries. So the expected outputs of the conversations we are doing is to increase the education and awareness on open science, but also increase the knowledge of the challenges for higher education stakeholders when it comes to open science practice and its application within their institutions. Now, some of the activities that we've done um, is that starting last year, we've been holding, as I said, we've been holding regional meetings. So we started in Tanzania, where we brought in all the universities in Eastern and Central Africa to, to, to and these are all vice chancellors and leadership in universities. And also in Egypt as well, we brought in all the vice chancellors from the Northern and MENA region to have this conversation on open science and what were the challenges that what were the things that were impeding them from actually adopting open science? And the reality is, even when you look at the raw map in Africa, there are only 30, 36 institutes that have adopted, that have open access policies. We're not even talking about open science mandates, open access policies, and that is out of 2,500 universities in the continent. But with 
with all said and done, there are some positive developments. So there are some select policy uh, positive developments. So we have Ethiopia is the first country in Africa to have an open access policy. South Africa as open science policy has reached stage two. And we have the East African community, East African parliament through the East African community and the uh, East African community, uh, East African Science Technology Commission, which is pushing for the, advocate, the advocacy of open science and including it within the regional of, uh, STI policy, which will mean we are going to have seven countries at a go adopting open science in Eastern Africa. And those, of course, with the Association of African Universities, we are looking at uh, working with vice chancellors in making sure that they adopt open science policies within their institutes and going a step further and having Senate meetings within the university so that we can the, the leadership within the universities can have buy-in on adopting open science. Those in the pipeline, as I said, is the, within the East African community and ECOWAS in West Africa, and we've been working closely with UNESCO in, this, uh, in these activities. Now, some of the select concerns that the vice chancellors and some of the, the policymakers felt that is that those poor attitudes toward open, towards open science, and um, they felt as though there was insufficient engagement on open science to leadership in university. So by the time it was hitting the, the, the leadership's desk, it was coming about, it was, the discussion was on open access and not open science. And some of the recommendations was that they need better, they need to enact workable and implementable policies that can promote open science within the university. So this is not yet clear uh, for as yet. So that is why when you're doing this dialogue, if you're trying to get practical and workable solutions on how open science can be implemented within this, uh, within these regions. Then, of course, with one of our, still within, with, uh, in promoting open science and through our partnerships, we are working with Figshare in training libraries on understanding, libraries and library consortia on understanding the FAIR principles, because that is also another thing. We are talking about open access, but not everybody is un understands, open science understands the various principles that would help in increasing the visibility of, of, of the output, especially if you're using infrastructure that is that needs to be fair, uh, that needs to be findable, accessible, interoperable, and the information that is there is reproducible. Now, uh, with our partner, Africa Archive, I had mentioned earlier, this is Africa's preprint repository. They just recently won a, a fund from uh, ORCID with the objective of facilitating African institutional reputation of building by enabling institutional owned scientometrics. So it still comes down to how we can work with institutions in increasing their visibility. So this is something that we are so excited about because it's Africa's only preprint, continental preprint repository. And what we are looking forward to doing, achieving is at the end of the day is fostering community-based uh, publishing workflows and facilitating the setup of, of, of cloud-based publishing presses, which will be supporting some of the, the, the publishing presses within the continent. And of course, what we've done is that we've created a, a local, we've established a local hosting partner by, by uh, working in partnership with Ubuntu Alliance. So Africa Archive is already hosted within the continent. Now, an exciting development uh, as we are winding up, an exciting development from what we are doing as TCC Africa is that we have created a startup which is called Helix Analytics Africa and its main objective, and this is something all of us have been talking about is, is how do we make open science multi-sectoral? So we've, we've, we've somehow managed to, to, to crack the code because what we are doing is providing, is, is providing open science for industry. Okay, and uh, with the objective of promoting uh, data for impact by leveraging on open science and modern uh, data infrastructure to enhance public insights. At the end of the day, the reason why we are having this conversation on open science is so that industry can have access to this information and they can leverage on it. And um, there are two divisions in this, and one is focusing on business optimization research, and under it, we are, will be supporting healthcare, agriculture, logistics, and manufacturing. And the other division will be on higher education and research, where we'll be looking at higher learning institutions. And that's where our current activity lies in, which is the Africa PID Alliance, which is the flagship of uh, Helix Analytics, which is a community of PID enthusiasts in and, uh, and, uh, in and from Africa with the aim to lead and realize a fair sharing of access and data through the use of uh, persistent identifiers in innovation, research, technology within the cultural, scientific, and cross-country ecosystems. In essence, what we are saying is that we are going to we are in the process of creating 
an, a research agency, a uh, registration agency that is going to be, will be providing PIDs, affordable PIDs, because that is also another thing that we, that has also been a big challenge, uh, affordable PIDs and DOIs for African research output. Now, the exciting thing about this is that we have already got commitments from African partners and by default through the African Union. So our launching partners so far are the African Academy of Sciences. Uh, we are looking at the association. The African Academy of Sciences is the umbrella body of all academies, national academies of sciences in the continent. Uh, we have already got um, support from the Association of African Universities, which is the umbrella body of all universities in Africa, of which all the leadership within the universities uh, report. And then also the African Library Information Associations and Institutions, because to be honest, the primary users will be the librarians. As I say, it still comes down in making sure that we have equitable access to solutions that can help in increasing African research output. Yes, we know infrastructure is a problem. Infrastructure is a problem, but we are seeing to see, we are trying to figure out how we go around that. Uh, how we go around that by making sure that we work with partners in providing, in increasing the visibility of African research output. But at the same time, let's be honest, everybody, there's always a cost when it comes to open science, but let's make it equitable. Because when you look at the ecosystem right now, even the PID ecosystem, everything is expensive. If you look at the, in, the academic infrastructure, everything is expensive. So we are trying, we are working with partners to help scale down on costs and make this as sustainable as possible, such that academic institutions can, can, can easily put this within their budgets in uh, making sure that they have access to DOIs or what the PIDs will be providing to help increase the visibility of their output, such that we don't have this conversation of, having select visibility of African research output. With that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for listening to me. And as we are winding up, we are looking forward to having more partners coming in from the Global North who will be able to join us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, and a round of applause for partnerships, right? Um, to increase visibility of African research and right, all types of research, including uh, the Global South as well. Um, I wanted to share with you something that goes hand in hand with her presentation. Uh, the potentials of the digital revolution for scholarly publishing have not been fully realized and moves towards monopolistic platforms threaten innovation and the global public good. That is one of the areas in need for reformation included in the uh, report from the International Science Council. And the title of that report is Opening the Record of Science. It's from 2021, but we know it's still current. So um, very interesting developments. Now we are going to the questions section. Do we have questions here on the floor? Okay, but we do have from the chat. Let's see, and um, great, we have the speakers with us. Okay, here's one about academic capitalism. Do we know how open access is done under a different political economic system like socialism or communism? And we don't have a, a direct person for this uh, question, but I hope um, maybe uh, Carolina could start. She mentioned academic capitalism. I was going to say I mentioned it, but, but to say the truth, no, I, I don't really know. Of course, um, if, if the idea is for it to be part of the commons, I would imagine, uh, I mean, I, I had a brief experience in Cuba and, and uh, journal, scientific journals will, will circulate free, but, uh, but I wouldn't be able to answer precisely that question. Thank you, Ms. Botero. These are still kind of emerging. It's interesting how these are um, in our world for so long, but we still need more information about some of this. And great, right? So it has a use that we have, we're here. Um, I have another question here, and this one goes for Susan Mary. If I see hands, I will, I will look to you, but I don't see any hands. 
So as an editor trapped in the vicious cycle of needing more submission citations in order to get indexed, index, uh, can you advise if JPPS is recognized, supported by universities to the extent that they actively encourage students to submit articles to non-indexed journals? Thanks for that question, Emily. Um, I don't have information on that. And what I can say, though, is that um, the Journal Publishing Practices Standards Framework is relatively new. I don't think it has been um, publicized and had long enough um, to actually sort of settle into the thinking <laughs> of um, of academia within within the continent and on a university or institutional level. I think that that will take quite some time. And as we know, um, there is a really unfortunate buy-in still in kind of the um, re research assessment um, in universities within within the African continent. Um, and it's unfortunate because the impact factor, for example, is, a, is one of the major tools keeping uh, the current um, imbalance and inequity um, within scholarly publishing uh, different, different, different from the North uh, and, and the Global South. Um, so we, we haven't really been um, actively working to raise awareness of the JPPS within universities um, around the continent, and that might be something that we can do in future, bearing in mind, though, that we are a team of five full-time staff and a part-time software developer. So, you know, we are asked all the time for expanded services and uh, of, of this kind, for example. But until we get, um, you know, increased <laughs> um, resources and, uh, and a financial sustainability plan that um, can expand to these sorts of things over time, um, it's not really something that we can accommodate ourselves. But thank you very much for the question. We would love it to be the case if the JPPS as, as an indicator of quality um, of African uh, journals um, was something that could, could become entrenched within um, the university systems on the continent. Thank you, Ms. Mary. I have a question here for the uh, three speakers. Do we need to ring the alarm of a new colonization of scientific knowledge? Do you have solutions for the way forward? Um, Ms. Owango, I'll start with you. Uh, we can't hear you. On mute, please. Okay. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah, we, we, we really need to be wary. Um, you see, coming from the global south, uh, particularly Africa, all of a sudden we are the new best thing. We've always been here, we've been producing output and we've been struggling to have our output visible. As I'd said, I'd noticed this when I was in industry and even right now, um, even those who are keen on working with us, not with in Africa, they, they either have a short-term plan. So you have to be very careful about this aspect. And because of that, um, the first thing, like in our case, the first thing we are doing is making sure that our partners have a long-term plan in the continent because of the geopolitical and dynamics. They are so different. You're working in a continent that is very dynamic. One moment it is okay, and the next moment it's up in up in flames. But you know, people are still conducting research. That is number one. And because of those challenges, one of the things you'd notice is that various things will fall through the cracks. So when we invest in ourselves, like what we are doing right now, when we invest in ourselves with what Susan has produced with the JPPS, with what we are trying to do with uh, with the, the Africa PID Alliance, it means that we are empowering Africans to to protect ourselves from neocolonialism by decolonizing research because we're also increasing the visibility of our continent, of, of the output coming out of our continent. We are also empowering, uh, we are coming up with sustainable solutions that will in turn be used uh, by, by future researchers in improving the visibility of the output that is coming out of the continent, such that even when we are working with our Global North partners, they're already working with, with, with the partners on the continent who have systems set in place that will protect the, the knowledge that is being produced as well. Thank you, Ms. Botero. Um, yes, thank you very much. I would say that 
probably the, the, the way that the publishing system of scientific knowledge works, it works for some, and I don't believe it will disappear from one day to another. But I do think that we need to start thinking out of the box. As long as the, the ideas of uh, the way the evaluation system, the way that the internationalization scales and so on continue, there, there's nothing to fix in the problem, the, in, the, in the publishing system. I believe we need to really think over uh, and, and try to come with other logics. The first one I would say is that uh, publish the, the way the journal system arrived with the, with the press. And today we have internet. I wonder if we really need to start thinking how are, how are we going to communicate science in the next decades? because probably uh, scientific journals are again, something made for few people. Uh, and we really need to start understanding how is it that uh, scholars are doing uh, stuff now and how are people reading and how, are, how do we really need to disseminate science? Um, I believe that the, the pandemic was a great opportunity to think this over and we kind of miss it. Why? Because it, it, we think that the cycle of scholar publishing is so long that it was not able to face the pandemic. During the pandemic, lots of people did lots of things to um, disseminate uh, in a hurry the science that was being produced. And I'm here not talking about science different from the Western science. So there are, uh, what I mean is that we have the chance and there have been cases when we've been able to uh, do science dissemination differently than the journals. Therefore, I believe we can do differently. Uh, otherwise, we're going to leave aside many diverse people that are producing science, many diverse knowledge that are already happening, and of course, unusual actors that are answering uh, important questions for local communities. Thank you. Yes. Okay. For now. Okay, now red. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, my name is Moriana Garcia. I am a librarian from the University of Rochester in Rochester, New York. And uh, as a librarian, uh, our libraries, you, you were talking about the problem of indexing. All libraries have nowadays what we call discovery layers. Yes, we, we have the indexing like Scopus, Web of Science, the, the, the big ones, the databases. But we have the discovery layers, which are the new catalog, uh, where we put everything mm. together. So I, I'm curious to know if in your efforts to increase the indexing, the exposure of uh, African science and, and Latin American science, if you are working with companies that produce those discovery layers, uh, like Primo, I know Primo because we use Primo. So it's thank you so much for your question. So um, one of the uh, to be honest with you, this is something we started we, we noticed like about two years ago when we started looking for partners to work with. So this what you're sharing with me is something I can also put into practice and add to the activities we're doing, especially when it comes to uh, organizations that have discovery layers. What um, that provide discovery layers. But what we were doing or what we've been doing is, is literally looking at the, first of all, the open access citation databases. Because you see, coming from the global south, we are looking at, yes, we're receiving these open access citation databases, but we wanted to see to what degree these open access citation databases had African content. And that is now where we, we started targeting those open access citation databases and making sure that they had increased visibility. So one of, that's what I was saying, like in this case, um, Dimensions is, is, is freely available through the Research for Life program in the entire um, Global South. So these are one of the partners who are very quick to take this up as a project to make sure that we can increase the visibility of African research output. And that means actively working with African higher education stakeholders in, 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 in getting their output index in the platform because African research output is just not only publications or research publications. There's a lot of 
uh, gray literature, which we use that wasn't visible. So that is why we felt that working directly with the, the knowledge producers in the continent, plus the platform, the, the open access platform would be a direct way of making sure that we increase the visibility of the output. But yes, thanks for the uh, suggestion of working with organizations that also have discovery layers. The time, thank you, Ms. Owango, we're almost at the time. Yes, Anna. Yes, sorry, I know we are almost uh, done, but I, I, I wanted, to, I, I, there is one, uh, one point that didn't come out in this discussion and, and usually it does come out. So I, just, I do wanna hear from the speakers what they think about that. And that's the question of multilingualism and the fact that we have a predominance of, of course, English language in scientific publications and publishing. And yet we know that if we want to kind of harness the knowledge coming from different regions, there should be much more efforts given to uh, making sure that there is publishing also in other languages. So what are your takes on that? And what are maybe some of the initiatives that you are taking to kind of overcome this, uh, this challenge? If I may reply to that um, to start with, please. Um, thank you for the question. Um, and, uh, and from Tom, uh, I'm, I'm guessing from the DOAJ as well. Um, this is something that AGEL feels very passionately about. Um, yes, the majority of the content on AGEL is English and, um, and French, um, but there are actually many other African languages represented um, on the platform. We have tried to, to be able to share um, those different languages and, and the numbers of articles, um, are, um, but we spent quite a lot of time and energy on trying to um, get a decent language detection API because there are too many articles to be able to get this information, you know, by by <laughs> a natural human being going through it all. But our challenges and possibly somebody who is listening in um, can help us identify a decent API that can actually correctly identify some of these African languages that we are working with. And um, the ones that we have trialed so far uh, can't even correctly identify, you know, Igbo. Um, or, or something like that. We, we, we obviously would like very much to, um, to support and, and promote um, the, a multiplicity of languages uh, um, on, on the platform. Um, and uh, on, a, on, a, on a first step kind of level, um, we are, once we get through our um, list of journal applicants that is 425 titles long with more applications coming in every week, once once we work through that, um, we will be a little bit more proactive in terms of actually recruiting um, journals publishing from the continent in languages other than English. Um, but again, that is resource dependent and and a, and a longer well a medium medium to longer term plan. Thank you for the question. It's an important one. Ms. Owango or Ms. Botero. Yeah. Um... One is a, a partial solution to, to, your, to your question, Susan. Masakane, based out of uh, Southern Africa, is, uh, is actually actively working with Africa Archive in um, translating um, English uh, public uh, research in English into African languages, so that in order to show the multiple, uh, the, uh, to, in order to, to, to make it accessible to the various communities. So Masakani is actually based out of South Africa. And so far they are doing it in Isizulu, they've done it in Swahili and also in Kenya, Rwanda. Maybe their API could be of help, especially, and the countries have actually, the, the, the languages I've mentioned, Isizulu uh, is, is out of South Africa and uh, Kenya, Rwanda, you know, in Africa, some of the, the national languages are the business languages. So Kenya, Rwanda, is, is a perfect example, example and Swahili coming out of Tanzania. So I, I bet maybe they could be able to help with some of the African languages that uh, are being published uh, within the, uh, that, are be, that, you're, that you're accepting within African journals online. Now, unfortunately for us, um, we, how we've managed to tackle the issue of language and multilingualism, multilingualism is by looking at uh, is by dividing the continent in the African Union languages. So you know, when we are doing our activities in the region, 
unfortunately, we, we actually look at it from the African Union languages. So that is uh, French, Portuguese, Swahili, and Arabic. And um, yes, definitely we would need to look at, into how we can make this much more possible because in the last open access forum that was held in Egypt, which we hosted, and then there's also another one which has been hosted in Egypt, one of the biggest uh, uh, issues that came up was um, language because Arabic, the, the conversation on open science in Arabic is is uh, in the Arab region is slow due to, to language and also in the Francophone region as well. So what we are doing right now is, is um, would any help that would help that would that would that can be shared with us on how we can improve on some of these support systems would be more than welcome. But for now, what we're doing is working on the basis of the African Union uh, languages on each region. I would like to address this question, very important question you pose, Anna, on two sides. The first one is Latin America is predominantly Spanish, of course, with an important Brazil Portuguese, and then the small languages in the Caribbean that um, will have something like what you just described, French, depending on the colonial um, past. But the truth is that uh, is exactly what you said. Most of the because of the of the objectives that currently uh, drive the the scientific publication, English ends up being the the one that most uh, prominent scientists will publish in, and therefore uh, very hard even for us to access afterwards. This is something we need to address, and and certainly it will help if if we if we start uh, opening to other languages. But just as as was mentioned before. The, the indigenous language are also something very important. Colombia has 50 million people and we have over 80 different languages. Of course, the Spanish is predominant and the most, the, the, the um, language, uh, indigenous language that is spoken by the most people is Wayunaiki, which is speaking by less than 2 million people. So you can imagine how many people are keeping alive those languages. And to address that, we will, uh, to, to, to think how to have multilingualism, really, we have to first address the fact that we are not acknowledging them as scientific producers. It often happens that uh, we will not recognize the way they produce knowledge. And if we don't do that, then what the, it is hard to speak about a scientific publication. Therefore, I believe we need to address the issue of multilingualism through different layers. Uh, one that will mean our current uh, scientific system, how to uh, allow or promote that it reach others and it is more diverse in, in language as well, but also the fact that we are, all our bet is on a single uh, way of seeing science. And that will refrain us from really having a universal idea of uh, how to disseminate uh, scientific knowledge. Thank you. We, we are catching up here. Thank you, or gracias, right, in Spanish. Uh, Thanos. So I just wanted to say, I mean, of course, thank you and uh, multilingualism, I mean, we are at the United Nations. Multilingualism is a, quite a big issue. Um, uh, we are uh, in a challenge, of course, with the resources we have. Uh, the Dakamas Collaborative is going to release a, a publication. We are a scholarly communications unit as well. So our unit is going to release a publication regarding the multilingualism in the United Nations. So I will share that with all the registration list. Uh, but regarding the comment, and because this is an open science conference, I'd like to sort of like draw your attention to the open source technologies in terms of discovery layers so that um, I know and I understand that in certain cases, this may be lead-ins to proprietary systems. However, open source technologies have reached criticality and discovery layers, open source discovery layers um, are there for us to use, to experiment. This is the time of experimentation and building up infrastructures rather than going into closed APIs. And I think this is my major concern. There's no time for closed APIs in 2023. Um, that is one. The second one is I want to put out there and we will share that with the registration list. The, um, the option that you may want to see what is the impact of all this 
amazing work on the SDGs. So what is the, the, the relation with the, MSDG, the, with the SDGs? And draw back to what I mentioned earlier, the, the, the linked data ontology of the SDGs, we would like to share with the, um, the whole everyone and sort of like help you perhaps, which is available unfortunately in only the six official languages of the United Nations, but help more or less become a little bit of a connective tissue on, on the work that we do under the mission of, of the world to create a better planet. Um, and we are not doing good on the SDGs. And I think my colleagues from DESA can sort of like elaborate more on that tomorrow. Um, and I think there was a question. Yes, okay. a question there, and we have two calls after. <laughs> it's on. Thank you. Uh, Cable Green from Creative Commons. I, I just want to, we're talking about translations, and I would just want to remind all of us that uh, when we're uh, setting up journals and we're working on policies that the reuse rights that come with open licenses are uh, critical and it's easy to forget them, but translations is an excellent example where if there's not a standard international Creative Commons license on the work, then translating a work might not be allowed. Uh, and increasingly, in, in two levels, uh, journals are increasingly looking at some of these new uh, generative AI programs to automatically translate works. Uh, and so the, the reuse rights to do that are important. And then of course there are languages, there are, there are so many languages that no one journal is gonna translate the journal article into all of those languages. No one country is going to do that. But when we put a Creative Commons license on, on a work, including a journal article, we empower uh, communities that there might be a small number of people that speak a particular language, but we empower them to make that translation uh, while all, the only requirement, of course, is they need to give attribution uh, to the authors. And so it's an infrastructure component that, uh, that we just need to remember as we're doing this work. Well, this is to be continued. Uh, it's definitely uh, evident the need of identifying actionable ways of continue supporting uh, Global South and all the different issues mentioned here. And now, our moderator. I was just wondering if uh, to close the session, also our, our, our panelists have like a, a couple of last uh, words with regards to, you know, the key take uh, take away, take home messages on the need to reform scientific publishing, you know, and, and what do we put in our report? to reflect uh, the need for reform and the way forward. I will jump in here <laughs> just to say that, uh, Anna, I, I, I do think that it is important to start thinking how is it that we are communicating today? If uh, the journal, the, the current system of, uh, of journal, scientific journals has, was a development of the press, we need to think what is the development of the internet as it is, I I, uh, no and and there and, and and we need this research to understand how the landscape is changing and how we can uh, produce differently, because otherwise we are remaining behind. Uh, think of the youth people, the young people that are growing with different ways of addressing uh, communications. And we need to also be able to, to, to get to them. I, I'm not, my English is, fa is failing me, but I guess I, I was able to make my point. Thank you very much. That's great, we understand perfectly um, your, your, your comments and recommendations and, and agree with them as well. Yes, please, Joy. Um, we need to have a better understanding and leverage on open science infrastructure. And uh, when we are, we, are, we, are, we are looking at reforming scientific uh, publishing, we also need to acknowledge the new types of scientific publi publishing outputs that come out of it and acknowledge them within our academic systems. Because this is what, as much as we are talking about reform, we are seeing that even still within the universities, they are not accepting them. So the question is, uh, at what level do we start uh, accepting this? Is it at a government level so that the, the institutions can, can accept it? So this conversation needs to continue, first of all, with 
adopting the making leveraging on open science infrastructure to support the system, but also acknowledging the this, the the ref, uh, these reformed uh, the outputs that come out of these reformed scientific publications that come out of uh, this whole process. And case in point, in especially in Africa, is preprints. Maybe it's not it's not uh, a necessarily an African issue, but it's definitely something that needs to be. Um, acknowledged and also recognized as 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 uh, as the new wave or the new uh the new wave in scientific publishing which is also leveraging on open science yeah. great thank you thank you very much uh, joy uh susan thanks very much for the opportunity to wrap up um i would like to emphasize that the solutions um to scholarly research sharing that have been developed from the global south in the form of regional platforms um, need the validity and the importance of those really does need to be acknowledged um, in, in the discussions um, all over the world on these sorts of topics. So not just always talking about the, the main commercial indexing um, entities, talking rather about the regional platforms also being valid and important and contributing indexing services for the journals from those regions. Um, I agree that journals are only one um, pathway towards um, open science um, from the global south and, um, and obviously globally. Uh, but that said, I think uh, I agree with Ariana that they, not just because I work for African Journals Online, but I agree that they, particularly as realized in the global south, they are valid and important um, means of um, communicating um, research from within developing countries. Um, I also would like to, to re-emphasize my kind of closing point um, about uh, the sustainability and financing of endeavors like these from, from the global south and particularly from Africa. We all know that it uh, contains the most um, least developed countries in the world um, and is characterized, unfortunately, by resource scarcity. Um, so even if um, more than one or two countries on the continent did manage to contribute 1% of their GDPs to higher education and to research sharing, 1% of a small GDP is still not very much. <laughs> and it might not um, let a, a regional platform like Agile even begin to aspire to, to reaching the, the kinds of sophisticated um, interventions that, that those in Latin America are. So. Um, in terms of realizing the support for for Africa particularly, um, I'm not sure that only, first of all, I think that it's critically important that African governments do start investing in our own infrastructure and our own sharing of research done in and from um, the, the countries and the continent. But at the same time, I don't think that will be sufficient to be able to kind of catch up in terms of um, proper representativity um, from our region. So. I, I would encourage you, um, as, as these um, members of, uh, of different um, departments of the, of the United Nations, um, to please uh, continue work act, working actively on, on alternative um, sustainability models to support uh, the delivery of these kinds of entities from the Global South. Thank you so much for this opportunity. It's uh, been an absolute privilege. Wonderful. Many, many thanks to our speakers and on the participants and uh, Loida for moderating this, uh, this session. Maybe just a round of applause for all of them. Great. Many, many thanks. Again, we've, we've heard a lot of different uh, um, uh, issues and I think some of them will now come back in the next um, in the next panel which is on equity in open scholarship uh, and it kind of ties in very nicely to this to this first one and I think already we have a lot of interesting ideas for the way forward and also for our organizations to try to figure out what exactly we should do uh, in a way to 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 support some of these new models, sustainability, um, and and, uh, and and also kind of a more equitable um, you know, publishing systems. 